Paris 1532. Inca civilization is at its height. In less than a century, they've grown into the greatest power in the Americas. On this day, the bloody civil war is ended. of his ancestors, Atahualpa drinks from the skull of his opponent, a skull lined with gold. It's the skull of Atahualpa's brother. see this Inca, he has a very mean face. The Incas were very powerful, so Incas were great warriors, and they had to be in order to become a great empire. This Inca, on the cover of this book, represents all the emperors and what they stood for in, in the great Inca Empire. These are llamas. In the festival of the Intirami, they would sacrifice these llamas in order to go sacrifice for their sun, their sun god. The Intirami is held every June 24th. This is one of the servants of the emperor. He is called a Chesky. He would deliver a message from for the emperor or from the emperor, and run all the way down. These chaskis run every day and cover many miles. These are the famous Andes Mountains, which are located on the coast, western coast of Peru, running down along the western coast of South America, running down alongside. This is where the Incas mostly lived around. This is the Inca dynasty. It started in the year 1200. These are the lords of Cusco. And these are the emperors. Later on in 1438 is when it grew to become a great empire. What does the sun mean? The 
son is their god. The son is their god. We worship the son. But the beauty was the emperor that wanted to make a big Inca empire. Which ended with Atahualpa in 1633. By doing what? He was captured. He was captured by the Spaniards. Choked him to death. By whom? By the Spaniards under uh, Francisco Pizarro. By the Inca dynasty. Why are there a dynasty? The Inca dynasty is because each one of these are related to one another. It is either the sons or brothers of the Inca Empire. It took 333 years, 1200 to 1533, how long the Inca dynasty lasted. But the empire of the emperor actually began in 1438 to 1533, only 100 years, until the Spaniards conquered it, conquered the Inca. My guest speaker now will be George J. Talbot, Director of the Department of Talbot Studies at Brigham Young University. This is Mr. George Talbot, Director of the Department of Talbot Studies. Okay. And I'm just going to ask him a few questions about the Inca. Yeah. Um, when was the Inca civilization founded? Well, my recollection is it's around 1200 A.D. Um, however, the civilization that uh, made up the Incan civilization went back much earlier, but it became unified as a civilization around 1200 A.D. Um, how many Inca lords and emperors combined were there? Well, you, I don't know on that question uh, how many there were. Uh, I'm guessing there was eight or ten. Do you know what Abu Wasco's half brother's name was? Uh, his half brother's name was Waskar, and uh, I guess uh, Atahualpa was uh, the other brother, half brother, who was more militant, and therefore he conquered the Inca. Do you know about the troubling of the cross? Um, well, uh, not an awful lot. Uh, there, uh, it was interesting in reading about the Incas that they had kind of a communal system where they helped each I mean, they were required to work so much uh, each uh, uh, week and, and contribute towards the society. So that it was kind of a communal type of situation that uh, everybody gave so much labor and so much work to accomplish what had to be done in the community. Uh, now, in our society, we tend to hire the police department, and we have the fire department, and we have to do it, and they didn't have it that way. They had people who just, uh, each individual helped and contributed to their society, whether it was in agriculture or other areas, they made a contribution. I thought that was kind of a nice thing. Do you know what the history says the name of the lake was that the first founder was with Atahualpa? I can't remember the name of the lake, no. I, uh, do you remember the name of the lake? Uh, lake Titicaca. Is that the Lake Titicaca? Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the lake. That's the largest lake, uh, navigable lake in the world, but I didn't know that was, was necessarily where they came from in the beginning. Do you know what was the name of the Inca city that worshipped the sun? Do you know when the date was? Uh, it's in June. Um, and it's uh, Inca Rami? Is that the Correct. name of it? Yeah. And they still have the festival each year in June commemorating it. Yeah. 
Well, I think uh, uh, dating is always a problem with most civilizations because we don't know, um, or people don't connect different periods of time. So the, the Inca and the Aztec and the Maya and some of the other cultures all can, tend to get put in the past without a sequence. And I think the uh, Incas are made up of... Uh, several other civilizations that date way back earlier. It's kind of like the Romans. The Incas conquered a lot of other different groups to form what is known as the Inca culture, which was the Moshe, the Lambayeque, the Wari, the Nazca, and uh, many other cultures that were conquered, and then they became known as the Inca civilization, which began in 1200. But the people existed much earlier uh, they just weren't in a united form, they were in separate groups. But the Incas became uh, uh, extremely uh, sophisticated in their building of stone. Uh, they don't know how they did it today, as a matter of fact, because you can't put a knife blade between the stones. Uh, Saxo Roman in uh, Cusco, uh, huge, huge stones weighing many, 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 many tons, having several sides and facets stacked together as a fortress, and uh, yet they are uh, cut so well and, and produced so well that they can fit perfectly with many different sides, and you can't put a knife blade in between them. Uh, it was unfortunate, I think, in a way that the, the Spanish conquered the Incas because they were a, a very sophisticated civilization, and uh, Spanish came in and due to disease and conquests, uh, their civilization was destroyed and all we have really now is a lot of Indians who are uh, living in poverty and the Spanish are ruling the, the country and the civilization has basically disappeared as an English civilization. Uh, many of the, the people, and we don't offer this as an option, but uh, people take programs and go down to uh, Peru, for example, but they were all the way down to Chile and all the way up into Ecuador. Uh, the Inca civilization covered thousands of miles. But they have their trails that people today will go down and hike those trails up over the mountains and so forth. And when I was at Machu Picchu, I found one of their trails leading up over the top of the mountain. And I went to the gate of the sun. I hiked all the way up to the top of the mountain just so I could stand in that and look at Machu Picchu from the horizon as you come into the saddle there at, uh, at the Machu Picchu. And, but those trails, the Inca trails, go all over. And a lot of people just like to go hiking. And they'll camp along these trails that were left by the Incas that the civilization existed for so many years. Thank you. I'm glad to help. Well, I am uh, glad here also to meet Mr. Carlos at the BYU um, Independent Study, I mean, Chabot no. Study Director. Be nice to meet you, nice to meet Mr. Carlos. I am so excited because I'm from Peru and I hear that you are planning a group um, to Peru pretty soon. Mm -hmm. and yes, and first part of May. Oh, wow. What part of Peru are you going? Well, we can, uh, Peru is a, an extremely unique country, and uh, there's really four parts that we like to go to in Peru. Uh, you have uh, the seacoast area, uh, which is sea level, uh, but then you That's also... where I'm from. <laughs> but you also have the, the high, we call it Alta Plana, uh, which is a high-level people who live up there. And so we, we fly up to Cusco, 11,400 feet, uh, and uh, you're in a totally different uh, environment than you are in Lima. We also go to Puerto Maldonado, which is the uh, rainforest, and it has all kinds of wildlife and birds and animals and sea lion. Prana in the river, we get to fish.
fish for some piranha. Yeah. Uh, you fish a little differently for piranha than you do uh, trout. Uh, oh, it's thing I never done, but I heard because I never been in the other side of the room. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah. piranha is kind of interesting. You know, when you fish for trout here in the Rocky Mountains, you take your line, you kind of sneak up on the stream. You don't want to scare the fish. You don't want your shadow to fall in the water, and uh, you kind of very quietly get up the oh. hole and fish in it. And uh, if you haven't scared the fish, you can maybe catch one. But when you fish for piranha, you take a stick and uh, you just swish it around in the water to make it sound like somebody's going through the water. Something's trying to escape. Yeah. And then you put a piece of hamburger or meat on to throw it in the water because all the fish have collected to see what's making all that noise to see if there's food. And then you, you get a bite uh, on piranha. So I've caught some piranha about like this two or three times. They, they really hit your line. They're going wow. full speed, and uh, I guess they eat them. Uh, wow. We didn't. I didn't try a piranha. <laughs> most of them, most of the piranha is, has teeth. But anyway, there, it's just a beautiful area, rainforest, uh, gorgeous country, lots of birds and wildlife. It's just beautiful at Puerto Maldonado. Yeah. Also at Iquitos along the Amazon. So you have the rainforest and the jungle and all of that type of life. Then you have the high altiplano, which is uh, Cusco, which is 11,400 feet. It's almost as high as Timpanogos. At the, oh, wow. the Mount Timpanogos, <laughs> that many of us are familiar with, is 11,700 feet. So this city of Cusco is only 300 feet lower than being living on top of Mount yeah, Timpanogos, which yeah. most of us can see. And uh, so you're up in this high area. If you went up to Lake Titicaca, then you're... 14,000 feet. And so you have that really high level and you have sea level. Right. And then uh, from the rainforest you go to Chiclayo and you're from Trujillo, mm -hmm. but uh, you go to Chiclayo or Trujillo in that area and it's kind of semi-arid. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's brush and, and desert kind Very of. Very deserted. But, yeah. but it's, uh, Between valleys. And yeah, but it's... Uh, there's still trees and there's still mountains and there's still, um, you know, it's, it's, it's arid but not terrible. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the people there are, are really wonderful people, but you have the, the ruins there at the Sipan and the Tucame. And uh, one of the interesting things, we go to Pimentel where the, uh, they have the little cabalitos, the little boats that they sail out yeah, of yes. the ocean. Uh, which is very interesting to see, and they fish all day and bring their catch in at night, and that's how they make their living. Uh, so that area has a lot of ruins, and at, at Trujillo, they also have the mud brick pyramids that are very interesting to see. So what he's saying is about the pre-civilization of, of the Incas, the Moche, the Chimun, the Nazca, which he, uh, Mr. Calvo is very acquainted for that. And I'm from Trujillo, uh, father of Freddy Jr. Uh, the last time he went was about 10 years ago when he was seven years old, so he doesn't remember much. But Trujillo is another story about this big uh, Moche civilization. And um, they were the ancestors of the Incas, uh, uh, along with the Nazca. So it was In fact, a, we could uh -huh. show this is from the Moshe. Oh, yes, there he goes. The uh -huh. knife. Uh -huh. This is that uh, for some kind of a sacrifice. We mentioned it? the little caballitos. Uh -huh. This is caballitos. About, uh -huh. This is the way, uh, kind of a little boat like, they'd ride uh -huh. on that. And That's what he fish. was talking about, a caballitos. Yeah, mm -hmm. they'd ride this out to fish, only they didn't stand on it like this is. They would straddle it like they were riding a horse. Uh -huh. Of course, this is the the knife that came from down in that area. You have a very good collection here of all the places <laughs> you've been probably around the world. That's in addition, uh, you know, we also go to the Nazca Lines. Uh -huh. uh, That's, I've never been there. It's something and, I would uh, like to know. Let's see, I maybe even have uh, a map of the Nazca Lines showing oh, the different, uh -huh. uh, different symbols that are on the uh, valley floor where they've removed and left little pebbles to outline these various things. So you have the, the condor. Uh, so these are different places in this that is, region. This, and yeah, and here's uh -huh. the whale. 
Uh, the dog uh, that they show here. Wow. Yeah. Uh, they have the hummingbird. It. it also has the. Uh, and these are huge, I believe. Yeah, right? they, these uh, are huge. You can see it. You have well, to yeah, see it I from think the this airplane. one. Uh, yeah, you have to see them from the airplane. They're about. Uh, I think the condor here is about the size of a football field and a half. Oh wow. So it's uh, 150 yards in length, and and so they're only visible for the air. But uh, there's also all these other lines. That's an that, idea. Uh, is there? So know we fly. How big they are. We fly out over the Nazca lines. We we take a boat and go out to Balestas Islands, and uh, so you know it's a very interesting area. Because uh, and to get there, you go to the Atacama Desert, which is the driest desert in the world. Yes. Never rains. That's uh, the southern part. Of the southern part. It goes down into Chile, and the uh, Atacama Desert is the driest desert in the world, and so. Uh, here you go from the rainforest to the driest desert in the world, and you go from sea level to oh, Lake wow. Titicaca, yes. which is 14,000 uh -huh. feet, and this is all within the country of Peru. That's right. And the Colca uh -huh. Canyon is, uh, and I haven't been there, but I was reading about it. It's the deepest canyon, navigable river in the world. It's bigger than the Grand Canyon. And what that's is the name? Colca. Colca Canyon. Oh, there are more places he knows them than I do. He has that privilege to go there again, and he knows and is very acquainted of the different regions that Peru has. The coast different from the highlands, which is the Andes, and the highlands are different from the mountains, the jungle, I mean. They call it mountain, but it's actually the jungle on the other side. So those three regions in Peru uh, is the uh, contrast, you say contrast? Yeah, well, you have, the country, you have actually four regions. Cause you have uh -huh. the you have the high, the rainforest, the, rain the semi-arid, and the absolutely uh -huh. desolate uh, Atacama Desert. One interesting thing is that while in the coast is uh, uh, summer, in the highlands is the opposite, and it's uh, rainforest, like you say, it's raining all the time. Uh -huh. And uh, it never and rains it's very cold. Ends, yeah. And on the other side, on the, on the jungle, it never <laughs> stops <laughs> raining. Yeah, the, the interesting jungle. thing is that the last time uh, some of them went down to Peru, I think they were cold uh -huh. in, the, in the jungle. Oh, really? And this is the first time it had happened, but there was kind of a little seasonal change, and the, the people over there were, were kind of cold. Wow, with this change so, of weather worldwide, I wonder how it's going <laughs> to look like. Maybe it was the, yeah. El, I don't know, it was the La Nina or El Nino, El but Nino. They, it had affected it, so it was cooler than you know, the people were kind of cold in the rainforest, and that was a first for many, many years. That's right. Well, Mr. Talbot is going to have this time again, the privilege to go there, and, and because of him, we have uh, this opportunity to enrich our knowledge and know more about other civilizations, like in this instance, Peru, and we want to appreciate uh, you so much, and we are very grateful for this introduction. And hopefully you go there and enjoy and also go to Huanchaco Beach where this is my city in Trujillo. And <laughs> swim a little bit. <laughs> You're going to enjoy it. Oh, Huacachina. Oh, yes. Huacachina, <laughs> more in the well, south. Yeah, Huacachina, however, is, uh, is just truly unique because you see it from the air. If I had a wow. slide, I'd show you. But it, it is uh, a lake inside of uh -huh. huge, huge sand dunes. Oh, wow. And trees, palm trees, and so it's kind of a re uh, oasis that when you look at it from the air, all you see is desert sand, huge sand dunes, and then out in the middle of all that is this trees wow, on the beautiful. lake, and uh, very attractive. You know, you kind of get a feeling of what an oasis is really like at Wakachina. Never been there, but someday... I don't lose that hope. I will be there. <laughs> if I go with you, that will be very good. You, you come with us. <laughs> yes, okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Talbot. You're welcome. I will now show you a clip from the movie, which is an introduction to the royal hunt of the sun.
1532, Francisco Pizarro and his small band of conquistadors invaded Peru in search of shimmering cities of gold. Though, let me pause it for a minute. Francisco Pizarro was the leader of the Spaniards. As he said, they came in search for gold. And the Inca's gold, and they had plenty of it. And of course, the Inca's lost to the Spaniards, which later on they take the gold from. outnumbered, they had two weapons that would prove formidable in battle. Their firearms. Though not, Though not very accurate and slow to reload, devastated an Indian army accustomed to closer combat. And the Spanish had horses, which had never been seen before. One 16th century chronicler wrote, The Indians were so terrified by the furious onrush of horses that they dared not appear in an open field, for ten horses could disperse a thousand Indians. To the Inca, the Spanish must have seemed like creatures from another planet with their suits of armor and strange four-legged beasts they inspired a mixture of fear and disbelief On November 16, 1532, Pizarro and his men would come face to face with Atahualpa. The event was recreated in the feature film, The Royal Hunt of the Sun. The Spaniards were only 168 strong. More than 80,000 Inca warriors camped nearby. But Atahualpa and his entourage of thousands came unarmed. He had no idea the Spanish might fight. His plan was to capture their horses for breeding. On a signal, Pizarro's troops attacked. By day's end, 6,000 Inca were dead yet not a single Spaniard. Atahualpa escaped with his life, but Pizarro took him captive. To gain his freedom, Atahualpa proposed a sensational ransom. He pointed to a spot high on the wall of his cell and offered to fill the room with gold. The chamber was roughly 22 feet long by 17 feet wide. Pizarro doubted it could be done, but gave Atahualpa two months to keep his pledge. Every corner of the empire was scoured for treasure, some dating back centuries, much of it captured by the Inca as their empire expanded.
At Ahuapan, the Inca thrived in a rugged, inhospitable region where few could even survive. Shaken by earthquakes and volcanoes, the towering peaks of their homeland had air so thin, visitors gasped for breath. And coastal deserts so dry, they turned men into mummies. Against all odds, the Inca rose out of a long line of civilizations who survived here for centuries. Civilizations like the Tiwanaku and Moche, Paracas and Nazca, Ica Chincha, Chancay and Chimu, the Inca's mysterious ancestors. Some built great cities that today are melting into mud, or wove stories in cloth wrapped around their dead. Some honored ancestors worshiping their mummies. Some are remembered by exquisite treasures. Others by age-old secrets, haunting images etched in the desert floor. But the best known of all, the Inca, would last barely 100 years. Soon after Atahualpa took power, a tiny but well-armed force of Spaniards would invade, threatening all the Inca had created. The most powerful empire in the Americas believed itself invincible. Their realm rivaled the size of the Roman Empire. Their system of roads could have stretched halfway around the earth. They had a vast fighting force that was tested in battle. With a genius for engineering, they had tamed some of the most rugged lands on Earth. Their messengers covered 250 miles a day, even bearing fresh fish from sea level to 12,000 feet. They worshipped many gods but believed the son, called Inti, was their spiritual father. Many of their most glorious creations endure. This magnificent city is one of many mysteries the Inca left behind. For centuries it lay hidden from the outside world, its purpose unknown, even to their descendants. It is called Machu Picchu. In 1911, Hiram Bingham, an American adventurer, led an expedition to Peru searching for the legendary lost stronghold of the Inca, Vilcabamba. After weeks of frustration, Bingham followed a tip along a tortuous route high into the mountains. Soon, his struggle would all be worthwhile. Suddenly, I found myself confronted with the walls of ruined houses built of the finest quality Inca stonework. It was hard to see them, for they were partly covered with the growth of centuries. It seemed like an unbelievable dream. For 400 years, Machu Picchu stood in silence at the top of the world. Now the last great sanctuary of the Inca was revealed. Unknown to their conquerors for centuries, this city in the sky embodies all the mysteries of the great cultures that came before them. 
Of all great civilizations of antiquity, the Inca and their predecessors had to master global extremes and environmental conditions. And with this went a system of organizing life socially, economically, and religiously that is extremely marvelous. If we can understand the mindset of these people that allowed them to survive and thrive, we will have a great key to true masters of the largest civilization in the Americas. And that is a mystery that we have been trying to solve. The Inca and their ancestors thrived by adapting to an unforgiving environment. Their bodies evolved, developing larger lungs and short, powerful legs to negotiate the steep mountain terrain. They domesticated animals like llama and alpaca, providing meat and wool for warm clothing. And perhaps most importantly, they cultivated a vast array of crops that would thrive in the diverse environment of the region. Corn was the most valued. They grew tomatoes and peanuts and over 200 types of potatoes. They cultivated cocoa plants, chewing the leaves to ward off hunger and fatigue. Generation upon generation had survived here, each building on the successes and learning from the failures of those who preceded them. As the population grew, they reshaped the landscape to meet their needs. Rivers were straightened, canals dug, and millions of acres of mountainside carved into terraced farmland. Like stairs to the heavens, they amazed the Spanish, who called the mountain range by their word for terrace, Andines. Though the Inca are credited with creating the terraces, many were built by their ancestors. And when the Spanish arrived, they just ascribed everything to the Inca, paid not a great deal of attention to the many civilizations, the many tribes, the many groups that the Inca incorporated. It wasn't until the turn of the century that archaeologists began to discover that there were marvelous ruins that predated the Inca by thousands of years, that the Inca were simply the political culmination of 10,000 years of adaptation to high mountains, to jungles, to deserts. These cultures were as varied as the regions they sprang from, but each had to master some of the harshest terrain and most severe weather anywhere on Earth. To the east, the Amazon, the world's largest tropical rainforest. Running west to the Pacific, the driest desert on Earth, home to the Nazca, the people of Paracas, and the Moche. Wedged in between, the rocky spine of the Andes, the world's longest mountain range. It is second in height only to the Himalayas. This was the homeland of the Inca. Here they thrived, despite the constant rumbling of volcanoes and earthquakes shattering their cities and destroying the canals that were their lifeline. If you shake that landscape forcefully, those canal systems will break down, and it takes a very long time to rebuild them. It's an entirely different world, a world of high altitude, lack of oxygen, scanty rainfall, earthquakes, natural disasters. It's a world that's alive. The Inca and their ancestors stood in awe of the power of nature. In addition to Inti, the sun god, they worshiped the mountains, the earth, 
thunder, and the moon. They expanded their pantheon with each new people they conquered, incorporating new idols and spirits as their own. But all people of the region agreed on one universal creator called Viracocha. As the Inca left no written record, we know their gods as we know much of Indian life from chronicles of the Spaniards. Pedro de Cieza de Leon arrived in 1535. The Indians say that for many days the world was in darkness. And then there emerged from the island of Titicaca the sun in its splendor, at which all rejoiced. And there came a man, large of stature, who had great powers. They called him Father of the Sun. Just as Viracocha was the father of the sun, so each Inca leader was the son of the sun. And in 1532, that man was Atahualpa. He and his people were masters of their world. At his royal estate of Pisac, there was a temple in honor of the sun god Inti. Though this was a sacred site, a fortress protected the emperor, his court, and the rich farmland on the terraces below. With a commanding view of the valley, it was designed to defend against the wild Amazonian tribes to the east. But soon, a new enemy would appear, an enemy in search of gold armed with their own god and powerful new weapons. An enemy that would threaten to destroy all the Inca had created. Inca emperors lived a life of extraordinary opulence. Atahualpa had many wives, and his choice of the most beautiful Inca women to serve his every need. His sacred body was clothed in the finest garments, worn once, then ceremonially burned. He ruled with absolute authority. In the empire's most lavish festival, he was honored as a living god. Held on the winter solstice in Cusco, the Inca capital, the festival of Inti Remi celebrated the sun and all its abundant gifts. The Spanish outlawed Inti Remi, but it was revived earlier this century. Like many Inca traditions, Inti Remi honors ancestors, believers in God, in their emperor, and in their own hard work. This system of belief recognized one's ancestors as being extremely important. Your grandfather, your great-grandfather, established where you would be in society. And because ancestors were so important, these folks engaged in what we call ancestor veneration, worshiping your ancestors. A major part of that was making sure that the ancestral body was kept intact. And to accomplish this, mummification of bodies became very, very important. The dead emperor would be embalmed, kept in his palace, but in a quasi-alive state. The mummy was brought out and seated with his ancestral mummies on all important occasions. If we were going to go to war as Inca, we would consult the deceased to make sure that we had their blessing. This Inca court of the dead was called the Panaca. But mummification in the region predates the Inca by nearly 5,000 years. 
In the arid deserts of the Peruvian coast, bodies naturally resist decay. Hundreds of burial grounds dot the landscape. Today, these remains reveal much about the past. This should be about a thousand years old. Either a young adult or female because of the size of the bundle. Compared to other bundles, the wrappings are very simple. So that probably gives a suggestion of her position within the society. Of the feet bones, I thought we might be dealing with a young adult female. The skin is all right in many areas like here. Muscles have almost completely disappeared. So I'm removing this second wrapping on the area that we should be finding the face. And, uh, but the hair is there. It has a hairdo that includes braids. Echoes of ancestors are everywhere, preserved in the drifting desert sands. Despite the harshness of the coastal desert, advanced civilizations thrived here. In 1925, two archaeologists traveled to a lonely outpost in southern Peru called Paracas, or sand falling like rain. They are drawn by reports of a large burial site in the desert. One is a Peruvian, Julio Tello, his colleague American, Samuel Lothrop. It is astonishing that such advanced cultures could have developed in this beautiful but barren setting. But more and more, remarkable artifacts were showing up on the black market. And out here, the evidence is even stronger. Teo and Lothrop had discovered the remains of a little-known civilization. The Paracas predated the Inca by 1,500 years. Of the many wonders they uncovered here, most mystifying of all were the bizarrely deformed skulls scattered across the sand. They surmised that heads of babies were bound between wooden boards to produce the grotesque elongation. The deforming of the skulls began when a child was born and continued until they were three or four years old. Only a small percentage of deformed skulls have been found, indicating it was practiced only among the elite or highest classes. Even more remarkable still were skulls with holes drilled or cut into them procedure called trephination. Trephination was initially a form of surgery for fractured skulls, but later on it was used in rituals to allow malignancy or diseases to escape. Remarkably, we know that about 60% of the people who had this procedure performed survived the operation. We know they survived because many trephinated skulls show signs of healing. The patient was usually given chicha, a strong brew, to help him relax, while the surgeon used tools of copper and bronze. Some operations involved cutting a series of grooves in the skull. Others, drilling a circular hole 
so a piece of bone could be lifted out. Centuries before the advent of modern science, these ancestors of the Inca performed medical miracles. But the full explanation for this bizarre practice remains shrouded in mystery. Perhaps the greatest enigma of all the mysteries left by the Inca and their little-known ancestors is that of a people called the Nazca. The Nazca thrived in the coastal valleys where water is scarce and the sun's rays unmerciful. Like the Inca, the Nazca worshiped the gods of nature, the sun, moon, and stars. In the desert, they constructed lines and symbols that mystify to this day. For them, the desert may have been a cathedral for sacred prayer, a celestial calendar to mark the seasons, or some have claimed a giant canvas for messages to ancient space travelers, creatures from other worlds. We may never know. All that remains of the Nazca now are giant riddles in the desert sand, mysteries that have baffled scientists and spawned a controversy bordering on science fiction. The Nazca lines stretch over 135 miles of desert. This bird is 450 feet long. Others are simply straight lines that run for miles on end. Though they can be seen clearly from the air, on the ground, they are barely visible. For over a thousand years, they remained unknown to the outside world. It wasn't until the 1920s that airline pilots began referring to the prehistoric airstrips. Before long, there were as many theories as there are lines on the desert floor. I try to prove that this planet has been visited by beings from outer space several times in antiquity. In 1968, Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods fueled a wild scientific debate. His thesis, the Nazca were communicating with visitors from outer space. By the landing itself, some sand and stones are blown away, and you have a simple track on the ground. And after maybe a few hours or a few days, they start again, maybe in another direction, you have a second track, the take-off track. I assumed that only later, when the extraterrestrials had departed, the natives came to the ground and saw these two lines, landing track and take-off track, and they would whisper, fiery gods rode on these lines. Serious scholars dismissed von Daniken's work in favor of more down-to-earth explanations. One woman had her own theories. Since 1941, Maria Rijka has devoted her life to unlocking the mysteries carved in the desert floor. I started walking just to see what was there. I walked on a line, and suddenly I found myself at the center of lines and followed a little further and found winding pathways which proved to be the figure of the spider. And from then on, I was immersed in all this vastness and I just looked for small winding pathways to see if they could be a figure. Rika spent years carefully measuring the lines and plotting their relationship to the movements of the sun, moon, and stars. She concluded the geometric lines are a giant astronomical calendar telling the ancient Nazca when to plant, irrigate, and harvest their crops. While her science may be sound, some feel she overlooked an important point. Somehow, she neglected the anthropological part. She didn't account for who made these lines. The evidence implies that since a lot of people worked at building these hundreds of lines, they must have had a ceremonial significance. 
they were some kind of ritual road that led people to certain important centers. It is likely that these lines were placed where dances and rituals were practiced. This is the annual pilgrimage to the Andean shrine of Coyariti. Every year, the faithful from villages across the region follow ancient pathways to honor the gods who dwell in the mountains above. At the ceremony's climax, the Indians form giant human lines in view of the surrounding peaks and in praise of their gods. One of the festival's more curious rituals is a ceremonial piece of ice carried from a high glacier down to the lines of believers below, symbolizing the waters that bring life to dry desert towns like Nazca. The mysterious relationship between the lines and the water has fascinated many. Eduardo Heran, a photographer, believes the lines were drawn to guide birds whose arrival signals the coming of the rains. The Nazca needed water, and it's possible that they designed the lines for the condors to see. When the condors fly over the lines, they are announcing that the rain from the Andes is on its way, that water is coming, and that's very important for the Nazcans. During the last years, we have identified nearly 300 new drawings. It's most important to be aware that Nazca is a unique monument, that it doesn't exist in any other part of the world. Today, it's easy to marvel at the lines from the air. Could the ancient Nazcans have flown as well? In 1975, adventurer Jim Woodman and balloonist Julian Knott attempted to prove they could by building a hot air balloon using materials the ancients would have had in ready supply. They used reeds for the basket and cotton cloth for the envelope. They funneled heat from a fire pit and lifted off flying over the desert for two glorious minutes. The lines have outlasted the people who made them by thousands of years. Surviving earthquake, drought, and downpour epitomizing the endurance of Andean cultures in the face of nature's overwhelming powers. But another force was gathering strength on the horizon, one that neither the Nazca nor the Inca could ever have foreseen, a force that would appear as alien to Atahualpa as a man from outer space. In 1532, Francisco Pizarro and his small band of conquistadors invaded Peru in search of shimmering cities of gold. Though vastly outnumbered, they had two weapons that would prove formidable in battle. Their firearms, though not very accurate and slow to reload, devastated an Indian army accustomed to closer combat. And the Spanish had horses, which had never been seen before. One 16th century chronicler wrote, The Indians were so terrified by the furious onrush of horses that they dared not appear in an open field. 
for ten horses could disperse a thousand Indians. To the Inca, the Spanish must have seemed like creatures from another planet. With their suits of armor and strange four-legged beasts, they inspired a mixture of fear and disbelief. On November 16, 1532, Pizarro and his men would come face to face with Atahualpa. The event was recreated in the feature film, The Royal Hunt of the Sun. The Spaniards were only 168 strong. More than 80,000 Inca warriors camped nearby. But Atahualpa and his entourage of thousands came unarmed. He had no idea the Spanish might fight. His plan was to capture their horses for breeding. On a signal, Pizarro's troops attacked. By day's end, 6,000 Inca were dead yet not a single Spaniard. Atahualpa escaped with his life, but Pizarro took him captive. To gain his freedom, Atahualpa proposed a sensational ransom. He pointed to a spot high on the wall of his cell and offered to fill the room with gold. The chamber was roughly 22 feet long by 17 feet wide. Pizarro doubted it could be done, but gave Atahualpa two months to keep his pledge. Every corner of the empire was scoured for treasure, some dating back centuries, much of it captured by the Inca as their empire expanded. Many of the most finely crafted pieces were made by the Moche people of northern Peru. The Moche flourished at about the same time as the Nazca in the south, reaching their height around 500 AD. This is the Moche Temple of the Sun. Once the largest pyramid in the Americas, it was built of more than 140 million adobe bricks. Believing it held a hoard of gold, the Spanish diverted the Moche River, washing away nearly two-thirds of this enormous structure and revealing astounding riches. The Moche kingdom was small compared to the Inca, but it was fabulously wealthy. For the elite, it was a life of high ceremony and bloody human sacrifice. The common people were rigidly organized and worked hard to build the state. Fertile fields were watered by elaborate irrigation systems, making their coastal valleys among the richest in all Peru. And they reaped the bounty of the Pacific Ocean. Descendants of the Moche still fish as they have for centuries. Strong men in reed boats, casting their nets on the waters.
The Moche rulers supported an extraordinary class of artisans and a highly organized religion. The images on their temple walls and ceramic pots hinted a life for the nobility filled with enigmatic ritual and erotic sexual practices. At a site near the city of Trujillo, a series of adobe friezes give a chilling look into moche life. It is called El Brujo. Local people had known about El Brujo for years and often searched for artifacts to sell on the black market. One was Arturo Carrera, who discovered the friezes in 1983. First we found a mummy bundle, and as we moved it, we saw the relief of the facade. Reliefs so beautiful that impressed us so much that we covered them with dirt and decided not to tell anybody. They were so beautiful that we were afraid others would come back and destroy them or rob them. The majesty of the artwork finally awoke the conscience of a thief. Arturo and his friends shared their secret with the authorities. Today, he works with the team deciphering El Brujo's mysteries. It's called El Brujo, which is a Spanish word for sorcerer, because this temple was probably occupied as, by a powerful shaman or a warrior priest in the past. What we see in this panel is a line of naked prisoners tied together with a rope around their neck. These prisoners are almost surely being led to their execution. The many human remains suggest the friezes are depicting what really happened at El Brujo. The big question is, what is the real meaning of the sacrifice? And the sacrifice itself is a conscious act of killing somebody in a symbolic way. It's the most precious good you can give. Somehow, if this big building is here with all these images around and all this art, fabulous art of Moche people, and we didn't find the real relationship between the art and the reality. In much iconography, it's very common to see images of sorcery or curing. And it is interesting to see that still in practice today. The ancient art is no longer practiced by warrior priests. Humans are no longer sacrificed. Today, curanderos are healers, using herbs and potions to cure ailments of the body and magic to ward off evil forces that prey on the spirit. I cure not only God's diseases, but also those that come from evil means. For instance, I cure an evil air, an epilepsy, a mental disturbance in the brain, all these things. Among the curandero's potions is a powerful hallucinogen made from the San Pedro cactus. Another highly destructive ancient tradition survives here as well. These are the waqueros, grave robbers, who sell relics of their ancestors on the black market. The poor farmers of Peru are encouraged to plunder the tombs of their ancestors by the growing black market in artifacts of the United States and Europe. In October of 1987, I was called by the police to help in identifying some recently seized artifacts. But upon my arrival, they showed me the most impressive treasure. Among them was an impressive gold head with eyes of silver and lapis lazuli. The 
treasure came from a looted tomb near the town of Sipan. Townspeople swarmed over the site, searching a massive pit dug by the looters. The police arrived the next day to restore order. The looted treasures had to be a sign of greater riches hidden within. Alva and his team began to dig. After sifting through the rubble for days, they focused on a 10-meter plot near the summit. What they found was a bounty that had eluded scientists and looters alike, a royal burial chamber, untouched for 1,500 years. It was a remarkable discovery. For the first time, we archaeologists had the opportunity to document the tomb of an important man from ancient Peru. In this tomb, we felt we were not alone, that there was a deep spiritual presence. We were resurrecting a character from his 1,700-year-long rest. We decided to call him the Lord of Siban. He was about 35, perhaps five and a half feet tall. He was surrounded by men and women, even a dog, no doubt his companions in life. And to his grave he took a staggering array of wealth. His skull and face were layered with gold, silver, and copper ornaments. He wore gold and turquoise earrings with a miniature warrior and battle dress in the center. Fully excavated, the Lord of Sipan's tomb was judged to be the richest in the Americas. For Alva and his colleagues, it was the discovery of a lifetime. I can remember when I was 15, I took my first picture of this site, despite the fact that I live very far away. I had come here without a thought of what destiny had in store for me. When I discovered the tomb, it was the fulfillment of a personal dream, as well as a professional goal, to show Peruvians that archaeology is alive, that we are here to recover the roots of the Peruvian nation, and that the Peruvians should feel proud of their extraordinary past. The Moche reign came to an end between 650 and 800 AD. A combination of earthquake and drought probably turned their farmland back to desert. Another in a long line of great Andean civilizations finally overwhelmed by the forces of nature. For the Inca, the end of their empire came differently. For months, the ransom raised by Atahualpa was carried to his jail cell and the hoard of treasure rose closer and closer to the line on the wall. Yet in the end, Atahualpa was condemned to die. He pleaded he would be denied reincarnation if burned at the stake. So instead, Atahualpa was tied to a chair and choked to death. His treasure was melted down to feed the fortunes of the King of Spain.
Although their empire was defeated, the royal Inca mummies continued to be worshipped in secret. But these powerful symbols of Inca tradition were a threat to the Catholic Church, which was trying to convert the masses to Christianity. Finally, the mummies were sent to Lima for a Christian burial to put an end to the pagan practices. The 16th century chronicler Garcilaso de la Vega described their departure from Cusco. They were wrapped in white sheets, and the Indians knelt and bowed, sobbing with tears as they passed. The Spanish, too, took off their hats, since these were royal bodies. <laughs> 